The red box stock has been the topic of many conversations as of late. And in today's video, we're going to look at its price actions, the recent developments, the technicals, and my opinion on if you should be buying the stock. As the market is still very volatile at the moment, we should always be mindful which stocks we're picking, as well as their individual timing and exposure. Before the video begins, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Over the past few days, the price action of Redbox has brought the stock from $3.20 before stabilizing around the current $13.20. Redbox has had an amazing run over the past few weeks and months, with retail investors buying up en masse its shares and hoping that the momentum will be on their side. So far in this venture, they have been proved right. Redbox has seen its stock price jumping by 700% from the low back in early 2022, and that momentum hasn't stopped ever since. The main reason behind the significant increase is because many traders believe that there will be a potential short squeeze for the stock, and when looking at different financial data aggregators, there does seem to be a very significant short interest for Redbox indeed. Of course, when we look at the profile of the company, it does make sense, just saying, it does make sense that some institutional buyers would be convinced that its business model may not fit very well with the current market trends anymore. But that doesn't change the fact that retail investors have identified this massive short squeeze as an opportunity itself and are now making it a self-fulfilling prophecy. Most of us would be buying a share because it's rising, and the more it rises, the more it may trigger additional purchases for other investors. This is why Redbox is very attractive for many investors at the moment. Now, let's also take a look at the technicals of the stock. The trading volume of Redbox has recently been 75 million shares, versus the average volume of 26 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, the price fluctuated between $1.61 and $27.22. The trading volume is a metric that can tell you how many shares are being exchanged hands, and whether there's a lot of activities and attention on the stock. It often gives you a first idea about the popularity of the stock, when we use it to compare with the average volume, it can also tell us if the company is enjoying additional momentum to reverse its trend or to break through current resistance levels. Even when the current volume is lower than the average, it is an interesting indication nonetheless because it may signify that a trend reversal may happen soon. The market cap of Redbox is currently at $600 million versus the enterprise value of about $300 million. To put simply, the market cap is the fair market value of the company based on the current market sentiment, the company's own reputation, and other macroeconomic factors, whereas the enterprise value is usually the cost the company has already paid for its assets. After paying off all the debts, it's worth mentioning that one of the most significant assets for a lot of growth companies may be the intangibles, meaning they're not necessarily equipments or inventory for the company to use, but they are the promises that this company can grow in the future, such as pledges for major contracts, blueprints for new products, and charismatic managers. For many startups, most of their valuations has been based on intangibles, which can be valued in favorable market conditions. In concrete terms, this may mean that there can be a huge difference between the market cap and the enterprise value, giving a false impression to market participants that a company is trading at a discount. It's only trading below its book value, but that doesn't mean that a company itself is necessarily undervalued. It's also possible that a company itself was overvalued in the first place, and it has only deflated ever since. As we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 445% higher than the one-month low, 667% higher than the three-month low, and 720% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which often gives us a hint of the market sentiment about where the stock price is likely going to head next, the implied volatility 
is 291% versus a historical volatility of about 343%. The put call volume ratio is currently at 0.23. It's normal for many stocks to also tend to have a higher put option volume than what they deserve since many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 353,000 contracts a day versus the 30-day average volume of 46,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been 230,000 contracts versus the 30-day average of 103,000 contracts. The option contract is a derivative product from the underlying security given participants the possibility to have the right to either buy or sell the security at a predetermined strike price. Buying the contract would give you the right and selling the contract will provide you premiums with an obligation to execute the contracts if the counterparty chooses to do so. It's often said that you can evaluate the likelihood of a scenario based on the opposite of what the current ratio is. If there's a lot of put options, then there might be a possible uptrend on a move. And if there's a lot of call options, maybe a reversal may happen soon. The reasoning behind that theory is quite simple, and that is most options expire worthless. In terms of its shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own currently about 300% of all outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Apollo Management Holdings, Vanguard, and Millennium Management. It's relevant to understand the shareholder composition of a company as this can help us to determine if you should be holding the stock long term or to view it as a trade opportunity. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, then it may be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long term trust from shareholders. Typically, the consensus is that there should be at least 25 to 30 percent of institutional participation for the stock to be perceived as a sound investment and not just a short-term trade. This is obviously subject to a lot of exceptions since many titles are mostly held by retail investors and not institutional investors, but that tends to be the exception and not the rule. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit if the share price falls lower. Sometimes, when there are significant short interest in the total volume, this can be a sign that there's an organized shorting operation going on, such as what happened with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is between 40% to almost 200% according to some data aggregators, and 50% of that transaction should be coming out from the dark pools. Usually, if the short interest is above 15%, and a significant chunk of it coming out outside of the exchanges, this may suggest that institutional positions have been taken to short the stock and there would be potential for a short squeeze. My recommendation, therefore, is to buy Redbox if you haven't done so already and hold the stock until the short interest drops down significantly, which is expected to happen in the short to medium term. At the same time, Make sure that your position is kept at the size of a short-term trading position and not to impact your position's balance as a whole. I would recommend to commit between 1-3% to of your portfolio's capital in Redbox and further recommend to split this allocation in batches of 10-20% to at a time so that you may purchase more in case of retracements. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here 
is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option, and assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When company announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.